It's three o'clock in the morning on July 3rd, 2018. The police are banging on the door of a house in a quiet, respectable suburb of North London. This is police. Yeah, police. The owner is a 64-year-old man called William Verres. I went to the window and there were a large number of individuals uh, waving torches. Bleary-eyed, he goes downstairs to see what all the commotion is about. The lights aren't working in the hallway, and in the dark, he's confronted by nine officers from Britain's National Crime Agency, London's Metropolitan Police, and the Italian Carabinieri. I immediately began to understand the nature of the visit. Dawn raids don't happen in this part of town. Verez's neighbours are bankers and property developers, lawyers and accountants. And him? He's a numismatist. He buys and sells ancient coins. At least, that's his story. The police? They take a different view. The officers barge past him and begin to spread out. They search the living room. They head upstairs to raid the bedrooms in Verez's study. They even climb a ladder to get into the attic and inspect a shed at the end of the garden. They strip the place bare, clearing shelves and cabinets, emptying drawers and trays. Thousands of coins of all sorts. They took away a large marble head of Augustus, uh, which may or may not be ancient, a collection of Anglo-Saxon pennies. They asked me for wrapping materials, which I gave them all the bubble wrap I had. What would they expect to find with somebody of my standing, somebody who's been a dealer for 50 years? The Italian police have been on Verres' trail for years. It's the largest investigation ever conducted by the Italian art squad, codename Operation Dimitra. They have arrested him before, but the charges didn't stick. Now they have enough evidence to prosecute. They surveilled him at meetings and tapped his phones. In the conversations they overheard, the speakers often used nicknames to mask their identities. One of them goes by Big Hair because his flowing locks make him look like a cross between John Travolta and Jeff Bridges. And Verez? He was the expert that all the other guys looked up to, the one they deferred to, the one they really respected. They called him the Professor. According to the police, he is the kingpin of a pan-European art smuggling ring made up of tomb raiders, counterfeiters, fences and frontmen. Together, he and his co-conspirators are alleged to have stolen 40 million euros worth of art and antiquities. After emptying the house, the police bundle Verez into an unmarked car and take him into custody. They charge him with 14 counts, including money laundering, wire fraud, forgery and conspiracy. If Verres is found guilty, he faces a jail term of up to 20 years. Verres's home isn't the only one being raided that morning. Across Europe, the police in Italy, Germany and Spain are carrying out more than 50 simultaneous raids to round up Verres's alleged accomplices. By the time the sun is up, the authorities have seized over 25,000 objects and 51 people are in custody. Verez doesn't deny doing business with his co-accused. I've known these people for many, many years in most cases. But he claims their business was perfectly innocent, and he never led a smuggling cartel. I didn't command anybody. These people are all autonomous individuals. But there's something you should know about his co-defendants. Some of them are suspected of having links with the Sicilian Mafia. So... Verez. Just a simple coin dealer? From Brazen and PRX, this is The Professor. I'm Simon Willis. I'm a journalist, and a few years ago, I was looking for stories about art crime. One day, I was having lunch with a contact who worked as a private detective, and he told me that if it was art crime I was interested in, I had to meet. William Verres. This guy was accused of being an international art criminal. But that was only half the story. There was also his plan to get out of trouble. Let's put it this way. It was 
audacious. In this show, we are going to follow Verez as he puts that plan into action. It is a journey that will take us deep into the underworld and to the dark heart of the most famous criminal organization of them all, the Sicilian Mafia, Cosa Nostra. It's a story of drug dealers, hitmen, smugglers, spies, even a corrupt prime minister. And in the middle of it all is one man's quest to save himself. How? By solving the most famous cold case in the history of art crime. Episode 1. The Nativity. When you imagine the house of an international crook trafficking in millions of dollars of stolen art, you might think of a luxurious penthouse, gold taps, giant TVs, a long-lost Picasso hanging on the wall, that kind of thing. That isn't how William Verres lives. It is March 2019, eight months after the raid, Veres is out on bail, and I'm in his living room. The place is comfortable, but shabby. The house of a middle-class bohemian. There's a dirty fish tank full of colourful guppies, a worn-out leather sofa, bits of wood strewn all over the floor. My son started a piano restoration, that's a mini grand over there, Mm -hmm. and you'll see bits of it everywhere. Veres has a taste for elegant tweed jackets and paisley silk scarves. He is portly, balding, and has a neatly coiffed handlebar moustache. His conversation is frequently interrupted by phone calls, which he fields in one of the nine languages he speaks. Italian. Oh, buongiorno, Enzo. Come? Or German. Ah, Morgan, Morgan. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, uh, or Turkish. Ah, merhaba, merhaba. Hepsi ben burda Verez may be out of custody, but he's still in a cage. He is wearing an electronic tag around his ankle, lives under a curfew, and isn't allowed to spend the night away from home. Several times a week, he has to present himself at a police station. Meanwhile, his lawyers are fighting an extradition claim from the Italian authorities. His legal bills are mounting, but he can't pay them. His bank has blocked his accounts. They don't like doing business with suspected money launderers. Whether his career was criminal or not, it's in ruins. Verez reckons the police stripped him of £400,000 worth of possessions. He says he doesn't have anything left. I don't have many shares or pension policies, so it's my wealth, basically. Total wealth. The way of this type of punishment, if we look at it in the cold light of day... It is actually to ruin you. It's been a hard fall for Verres. Over the course of his career, he has had houses in Switzerland, Germany and the south of Spain. Businesses in London and Zurich. Clients all over the world. Billionaires, politicians, even the British Museum. He's been photographed at glamorous art world parties, chatting to the rock star Chrissy Hind, lead singer of The Pretenders. In the world of antiquities... His expertise was in high demand, even from fellow experts. I'm Eleni Vasilica. I cut my teeth at the Brooklyn Museum and then I was keeper of ancient art in the Fitzwilliam Museum at the University of Cambridge for 10 years. William is a coin nerd, very knowledgeable in history. If I needed to ask someone I might I might actually want to ask him about a certain period or what was going on he would know that I've read that he's called the professor in southern Italy by dealers and traffickers uh, because he is so knowledgeable and now to make ends meet Verez is trying to buy and sell a few things online so some English pennies here I bought on eBay from a German dealer a nice penny of Henry II, I believe that's Richard I, possibly. Yes, that's Richard Lionheart. Not a bad coin. Verez was born in Hungary in 1953. 
When he was three years old, his family escaped Budapest, just before Soviet tanks rolled into the city to crush the revolution in 1956. They settled in London. Veres's father, who was a tailor, got a dream job on Savile Row. With Cyril Castle, who was termed in those days tailor to the stars. The castles actually dressed James Bond in the form of Roger Moore at the time. So we got to know Roger Moore coming to my father's atelier, if that's what you want to call it. Those are his scissors still, you see? Taylor's scissors. Growing up, Verez's school friends called him Weird Veers, deliberately mispronouncing his foreign name. Verez was the kind of kid that bullies are drawn to. Nerdy, solitary, obsessive. Already his main obsession was coins. And he remembers his first big deal to this day. 1968, so I'm 14 years old then. And we're looking at a, a receipt for a coin left at Spinks. Spinks is an auction house, um, then located in Mayfair, um, London's poshest district. Well Verez is haggling with its main coin expert. Well, you can see it's a letter from Douglas Liddle. On the 14th of November 1968, he writes to me, Dear Mr Verez, with reference to the small penny of Elizabeth I, which you left with me, I have now explored the market for this and could obtain for you a net sum of £150. I think this is a very fair offer, because although the coin is, of course, excessively rare, it's a very small one and also in poor condition, and therefore very much a student piece. Yours sincerely, D. Little. Stepping into the famous sale rooms at Sphinx, Verez rubbed shoulders with rich establishment collectors. From that moment, coins became more than just his hobby. They became his route into English society. All he needed was a steady supply of valuable antiquities to sell to those collectors. And in the 1970s and 1980s, that was easy. Especially if you had friends in Sicily. So this is Domenico Modugno a singer from southern Italy. He recorded this song in 1973. It's called Amara Terra Mia, My Bitter Land, and it's a lament for the place he's leaving behind. Addio, addio, amore, Goodbye, goodbye, love, I leave my bitter land, bitter and beautiful. This was Sicily in the 1970s. Poor, violent, riddled with crime and corruption. Life here has become dominated by a more sinister kind of family, one so secretive and so ruthless that most Sicilians fear it and publicly deny it even exists. Almost every morning there was another bullet-riddled body in the streets of Palermo, Sicily's capital, or slumped over the steering wheel of a car, victims of the Mafia's turf wars. Since the Second World War, thousands had been leaving every year for better lives elsewhere, people like the man in the song. But where some saw terror and desperation, others saw opportunity. Because Sicily was a gold mine. Sicily was the breadbasket of the ancient world. It was part of Magna Grecia, which was the kind of Greek diaspora. And the colonies there created an agricultural society that really fed much of the ancient world. And as a result of that wealth, they built huge monumental temples to the Greek gods and lavishly decorated these and had a populace there that was quite wealthy. That's Jason Felch, an author and investigator who published a book called Chasing Aphrodite, about the illicit antiquities trade. So the grave goods in Sicily are amongst the best archaeological evidence we have of Greek society and the the riches that the ancient Greek world had. But the Sicily of the 1970s was very different. Yeah, you had the combination of two factors that are usually behind archaeological looting. You had a very rich archaeological history just below the surface. And at the same time, on the surface, you have political instability, unrest, poverty, a lack of government attention in that region. 
because the government did not play a strong role in society, uh, mafia groups really dominated. And organized crime communities really controlled businesses above ground. And the combination of those two, the rich archaeological sites and organized crime's dominant role in society, meant that it was a prime spot for looting for decades. Verez began going to Sicily as a young dealer in the 1970s. I used to go to coin fairs there. Now, the coin fairs were somewhat different there because, of course, in Sicily, you'd get more diggers. Sicily's diggers were usually poor, unemployed people, armed with metal detectors and shovels and hoping to hit the jackpot. Statues, ceramics, gold and silver vessels, and sometimes, literally, money. There was a huge boom when the first detectors came out, you can imagine. You could find hundreds of coins in it within a day. So it goes hand in hand. Unemployment, lots of archaeology. If these diggers and tomb raiders struck it lucky, the art world was waiting to buy up their discoveries. Because in those days, nobody cared whether antiquities were looted or legitimately acquired. You could do everything you wanted. Nobody was interested. This means that... This is Arthur Brand. Brand is a kind of art world celebrity, lauded in the international media for his work recovering stolen art. If a grave robber in Italy found a tomb of a, of a royal, whatever, and uh, he found gold, silver, stuff like that, now we say this should go to a museum. But in those days, a grave robber would put it up for auction. Even the biggest museums in the world bought from these grave robbers at the time. This trade was worth millions of dollars. Here's Jason Felch, the author and investigator again. Some of the most remarkable pieces of ancient Greek art in the world came from archaeological looting in Sicily in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. This would include the Gettys Aphrodite, which was dug up in Morgantina in the late 70s. They broke this massive sculpture into three pieces and smuggled it in the back of a carrot truck from Sicily all the way up the spine of Italy to Switzerland, where it was smuggled across the border and put back together before it was sold to the Getty in 1988 for $18 million. So how close was Verres to the biggest looters in Sicily? Well, put it this way. Orazio di Simone was the one who smuggled out of Italy the Aphrodite of Morgantina. Orazio di Simone, in fact, was my best man at my wedding. Now, I had nothing to do with that. But, of course, the association is rather unfortunate. In Sicily, where there was money to be made, there was the mafia. Here's Eleni Vasilica, the ancient art expert. If you think of some poor Sicilian who barely speaks or cannot even speak Italian, speaks dialect, it's not possible for that person to sell something to a dealer in Mayfair or in New York without some sort of infrastructure. And the mafia provided that infrastructure. It's a kind of force that can negotiate judges, customs officers, transport agencies, and hide the material or pay people off in order to get the material out of Sicily. If you were a dealer working in Sicily, you probably crossed paths with the mafia, whether you knew it or not. In Sicily, it's impossible not to know somebody who is in the mafia, whether it's a, a relative, a friend of a friend. It's just like saying it's impossible not to speak English in Wales. Some of the contacts Vera's cultivated in Sicily turned out to be directly implicated in mafia activity. His biggest sale came in 1991, when he acquired a golden bowl from the 5th century BC for $90,000. The man he got it from was an old Sicilian friend. He was a very erudite collector. He was a landowner, well positioned in, in Sicilian society. And um, he was a very interesting, eccentric character, a typical collector, a little bit loopy. The bowl was eventually sold to a billionaire in New York for $1.2 million. Verez acted as an intermediary in the sale. And the man he bought it from? Well, one day in 1999, Sicilian police came to his palatial house to arrest him. Well, as I say, um, I can't remember the exact details, but he was accused of collusion with the mafia, using mafia money to collect and make money with antiquities and coins. In the art world, having contacts like this can ruin your reputation. 
but it can also make you useful. Here's Arthur Brand again. It's like a pyramid. and the bottom, you have the petty thieves, the people who do illegal diggings in Italy or wherever. And at the top, you have like 40 men and women who control more or less the business. William knows them all from the top to the bottom. We'll be back after this short break. Yeah, I will press record here now. Good, okay. So yes, Arthur, what I want to do today is just talk a bit about the Caravaggio. Arthur Brand, the art world celebrity, is the second big character in our story. He started out as a small-time coin collector, but about two decades ago, he began to track down stolen masterpieces. Picassos, Dalis, treasures looted by the Nazis during the Second World War. He's often compared to a certain brash, swashbuckling hero. This is a man who's been referred to as the Indiana Jones of the art world. He's been dubbed the Indiana Jones of the art world. My guest today is perhaps the world's greatest art detective, dubbed the Indiana Jones of the art world. Brand has turned this work into a small media empire. He has his own show on Dutch TV called The Art Detective and has written a bestseller about his recoveries. Arthur Brand has become, well, a brand. And right now, he is hoping to crack the coldest case in the history of art crime. One or two or three or four thieves entered this church in Palermo cut off the Caravaggio and walked away. That's all we know. The Caravaggio in question is the nativity with St. Francis and St. Lawrence, painted in 1600. It was stolen in 1969 from a Sicilian church. It could be worth as much as $100 million today, making it one of the biggest thefts in art history. But for 50 years, the case has thwarted investigators. Well... There are some facts, and the rest is speculation. The most credible theory is that two or three or one local thief cut down the Caravaggio, and afterwards this group voluntarily or forced gave it or sold it to a mafia boss. That's normally the theory which is most accepted. Every criminal in towns like Palermo is somehow under protection of the Mafia. You just can't go around stealing from tourists or starting your own drug transport unit or whatever without permission of the Mafia. For Brand, the Caravaggio is the holy grail of art recovery. He is desperate to find it. But he doesn't work alone. Over the years, he has cultivated a network of underworld informants, people who know where stolen stuff ends up and who has the keys. That's where William Verres comes in. Brand calls him Bill, by the way. I once asked Bill, how many mobsters do you know in Sicily? He says, well, officially, none, because it's not like they are dressed in a uniform. But he said to me, look, Arthur, we all know that if you go to Sicily, you're on a bed and breakfast, or you go there shopping oranges, the guy could be a mobster, you know? It's so widespread there that you never know who you're dealing with. So he said, I probably know some of them without knowing that they are in the organization. But these two men need each other. Bran needs Verez and his mafia contacts to find the Caravaggio. And he thinks he can help Verez in return. Because Brand also has contacts with police all over Europe, including in Italy. You cannot go around as a civilian, as I am, in the underworld uh, without having some kind of permission. You have to do everything in coordination with the police forces. If Verez can make himself useful to Brand and to the Italian authorities, maybe they can help Verez cut a deal with the Sicilian public prosecutor who has put him on trial. Find the Caravaggio and stay out of jail. 
when I asked William to help me, I have to offer him something. I said, look, I know you have troubles with the law. You're going to face a judge and uh, the judge will say, look at all the things you did wrong. Is that not anything good you did? In the meantime that you are waiting at home to face the judge, let's do something good. Bad people can do good things. Veres doesn't just need Brand's help for his own sake. He has a family to support, and his family life is complicated. While I was reporting this show, one of his three sons died in a car accident after a long struggle with mental illness. Veres cannot afford to go to prison. The Caravaggio may be the only thing between him and a jail cell. It's a Friday morning in October 1969. Antonella Lampone is 15 years old. She lives in Palermo, Sicily, where her mother works as a caretaker in the Oratorio di San Lorenzo, a Baroque church in the city's old centre. Their tiny apartment is right across the courtyard from the church's heavy wooden door. That Friday, Antonella watches as her mother strolls across the cobbles to unlock the church and prepare it for Mass the following Sunday. And when she went in, she looked and uh, saw that the canvas had been cut, and she came out crying. This is Antonella speaking to me in 2022, remembering that day more than 50 years earlier. The church had been shut all week, since last Sunday's Mass. But at some point, someone broke in and stole one of Italy's most valuable paintings, Caravaggio's nativity with St. Francis and St. Lawrence. It was a precision job. The thieves scaled the altar to get to the painting, which hung high above it. Then they cut the canvas from the frame so perfectly that not a speck of paint was left behind. It was a night of very heavy rain with thunder. With that thunder, you couldn't hear anything. They had also stolen a carpet in the sacristy, a very large rug of no value, which had certainly been used to wrap the canvas painting. This wasn't one of those ingenious crimes where a crack team of expert thieves outsmarts museum guards and high-tech security. It didn't have to be. The old centre of Palermo had been badly bombed during the Second World War and hadn't yet been rebuilt. The place was practically abandoned. Not even the Caravaggio was protected. I know it sounds crazy. At that time, there were not even grates on the windows. It was very easy to steal it. All you had to do was force the lock and you were in. Any old petty thief could have done that. We're going to get to the police investigation in the next episode. For now, all you need to know is that the painting has never been seen again. This was Palermo in the 1960s. The Mafia controlled the island. Palermo was its power centre. You couldn't so much as open a coffee kiosk in the city without the Mafia knowing about it, much less steal a multi-million dollar painting. And so suspicion, inevitably, began to fall on them. If there's one thing the Mafia does well, it is keeping secrets. And nobody was saying anything. But then, 20 years after the painting disappeared, and completely out of the blue, someone began to talk. His name was Francesco Marino Manoia. But within the Mafia, he was known as the chemist. In the 1970s and 1980s, the Sicilian Mafia controlled the international heroin trade, supplying addicts across Europe and the United States from a network of heroin refineries in Sicily. Manoia ran the labs, hence the chemist. The police also suspect that he worked as a hitman. He once said that to strangle a man is very cruel and horrifying. By comparison, dissolving the body in acid is nothing because by then the victim has stopped suffering. But eventually, the killer became the prey. 
the early 1980s are periods of intense violence in which literally thousands of people are murdered in and around Sicily. This is Alexander Stieler. He is an American journalist who covered Italy and the Mafia in the 1980s and 1990s. At that time, a new branch of the Mafia, from the town of Corleone, began a war within Cosa Nostra in a bid to take control of the organization and its drug business. As part of that power drive, they began killing everybody associated with the old clans, people who were connected to the old families are on the run, hiding out, and in many cases, watching helplessly as their relatives are being exterminated. And this inevitably creates a kind of backlash. Manoia was one of the people who turned against the Mafia. And in 1989, he began to collaborate with the state. Francesco Marino Manoia's brother disappeared, was kidnapped and probably killed. And Manoia understood that he would be next. So he essentially cooperated to save his life. This is Maurizio Ortolan. He is a retired Italian cop, and in the 1980s he was tasked with protecting mafiosi, who had turned state's evidence. Manoia's decision would have catastrophic personal consequences. In revenge for his betrayal, the mafia murdered his mother, sister and aunt. At that time, the Mafia followed a scorched earth policy with any Mafia members who collaborated with the state. They killed all their relatives. Manoia began to give evidence to Italy's leading anti-Mafia investigator, Giovanni Falcone. Ortolan was there to transcribe the testimony. The three men, gathered in a small theatre in Rome, usually used for police training. On stage were two desks, illuminated by a single light bulb. We smoked a lot, because Dr Falcone smoked a lot. Marino Manoia smoked more than him. I smoked as well. There was always a cloud of smoke on this stage. Manoia's testimony was a litany of assassinations, international drug trafficking and extortion. He himself was responsible for over 20 murders. But that day in 1989, he was talking about how he joined Cosa Nostra in the first place. It was all because he stole a painting. Manoia recounted when he was still a boy, not even 18 years old. Some mafia guys started inviting him along to commit petty thefts or small criminal episodes. One of these times that they took him with them, he told me that he participated in the theft of the Caravaggio nativity. It was one of the first things he did. To Manoia, the Caravaggio wasn't all that important. It was just something he took to prove himself to local bosses. He said that they went to this place called the Oratory of San Lorenzo. They got in very easily because there were no locks on the windows and they cut the painting, leaving the frame in place. Then they rolled the painting and loaded it on a truck that they had brought to take it away. Finally, after 20 years of silence about the theft of Caravaggio's nativity, here was confirmation that the Mafia had taken it. The question is, do they still have it? It's 2021. Beres and Brand are in a back room of an Amsterdam hotel, behind the lobby. Brand has arranged a meeting. I inform the Dutch police and I say, look, the Caravaggio, I'm going after it. And then I ask them, uh, please inform the Italians that I am trying to recover that piece. Today, three Italian agents are here to meet with Brand and Verres. They are from Italy's anti-mafia investigative directorate, the DIA. Two male agents, I've, I've calculated in their late 30s, early 40s, and um, a woman who 
was supposedly the second in command of the organisation. The DIA oversees mafia investigations. It also tries to seize mafia assets, assets like priceless stolen paintings. The police, the Carmigneri and other police groups, of course they know that the mafia is involved. But the trouble is getting current members of the mafia to admit that, or to give up information about where the painting might be. And that's why Veres and Brand are at the hotel in Amsterdam. They are going to offer to help obtain information. And if Brand and Veres are successful, the Italians agree to talk to the public prosecutor in Sicily to help Veres in his own case. If I managed to recover something, they would speak to the prosecutors. The Italian police are used to doing this kind of deal. Offering favours in exchange for information has been the key to cracking down on organised crime for decades. Members of the Mafia who collaborated with prosecutors were often given lighter sentences. Some avoided jail completely. So here's Veres's plan. He is going to reach out to contacts in the underworld to see whether he can shed light on a case that has eluded the Italian authorities. Uh, you find it simply by using human resources, by speaking to people who have a chance to speak to people who you or they suspect know something about the, the case. You have to get to mafia sources or people. And then, of course, at some stage, somebody within the mafia will be making a decision. About whether to give it back. Uh, or how to give it back. Under what terms to give it back. Sometimes when you put somebody in the middle, like me, who knows friends or friends or friends, sometimes it does work out. So that's one of the reasons why I think they let me do what I do. And the most important thing is, Bill is willing to help for whatever motive. Now is the perfect time. Verez's lawyers have successfully fought against his extradition and a British judge has agreed to lighten his bail conditions. Meanwhile, his case is stuck in a COVID-related backlog in the Sicilian courts. If we can recover the Caravaggio, it would obviously make a great deal of difference. The delay gives him a window of opportunity and he knows exactly where to start. Next time on The Professor. It wouldn't surprise me that some informants said, look, this is the person who has the Caravaggio. And if that turned out to be a very close friend to Berlusconi, well, what do you think? This has been The Professor with me, Simon Willis. This podcast is written and co-created by me. The show is produced by Brazen in partnership with PRX. Rubini Bamasheka is managing producer. Susie Armitage is our story editor. And Lucy Woods is our associate producer and fact checker. Mixing and sound design by Claire Urban. Executive producers for Brazen are Bradley Hope and Tom Wright. At Brazen, Marianne Hel Gonzalez is our project manager. Megan Dean is our network manager. Francesca Gelardi Quadrio Curzio is Italian research assistant and podcast strategist. Arnav Benaikia and Noor Abdel Latif are assistant strategists. Ryan Ho is the series creative director. Cover art designed by Julian Pradia. Our interpreters are Daria Bocchetti and Lawrence Mogridge. Voiceover translation from Denise Marino and Tommaso Talun. For more information on this podcast and other podcasts from Brazen, go to our website brazen.fm.